And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance. Pros no longer have to sacrifice power for a smaller power tool. The Home Depot has the DeWalt Atomic Family of Cordless Drills, Saws, and more. 25% more compact, 21% more torque, 45% more power, and 0% sacrifice. Right now, get a free DeWalt 2-amp hour, 20-volt max battery with select purchase. The DeWalt Atomic Family of Power Tools, only at the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. See store for details, U.S. only. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 354. Walls, obstacles, roadblocks. These are not here to stop you. They are here to see how bad you want it. Anonymous. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by FilmTools.com. Since 1996, Film Tools has been Hollywood's one-stop shop for all things production. No matter what your filmmaking needs, Film Tools has you covered when you need gear for your next shoot. Anytime I need anything really quickly, I go to Film Tools. They always have every single kind of production nugget and thing that I might need. No matter how small or big it is, they definitely have it. And this week, Film Tools is offering the Indie Film Hustle Tribe 5% off all purchases at FilmTools.com. Just use the coupon code IFHPOD. That's I-F-H-P-O-D at the checkout at filmtools.com. Today's show is also sponsored by the Make Your Movie Boot Camp. You want to make a feature film, but you have no idea where to get started. I feel you because that's exactly where I was years ago when I first got started. But I finally decided to stop talking about making a movie and go out and just do it. I want to help filmmakers break through their own fears and show them the secret sauce on how to make a profitable feature film. So I decided to put together the Make Your Movie Boot Camp and condense all 25 years of my experience into a two-day intensive. And in the camp, I cover how to flesh out your idea, the screenwriting process, finding money, crowdfunding, directing your film, post-production workflows, marketing, submitting to film festivals, film deliverables, self-distribution secrets, and how not to get ripped off by predatory film distributors. Think of this as a jumpstart to your filmmaking career and a replacement from a very expensive film school. This boot camp will be held in Burbank, California on October 26th and 27th at the Hilton Garden Inn in downtown Burbank. If you want to get 20% off the boot camp, just head over to mymbootcamp.com. That's Make Your Movie or mymbootcamp.com. Now, guys, with all this talk of film distribution, predatory film distributors, this whole debacle with distributor and what impact it's having on filmmakers in the community today. I wanted to bring on to the show an OG, an original gangster when it comes to educating filmmakers about film distribution. Today's guest is Jerome Crochon. And his revolutionary DVD course called The Secrets to Distribution really helped hundreds if not thousands of filmmakers get their films to the marketplace. Now, Jerome's been on top of this whole distributor debacle. And if you're part of the Protect Yourself from Distributor Facebook group, you'll see him pop up here and there with information and tips and tricks on how to navigate the film distribution world. So I wanted to bring him on the show so we can just sit down and talk shop. And we did. This turned out to be an epic conversation that lasted nearly two hours. But if you want to know about film distribution, if you want to know about what's happening right now in the world of independent film distribution, this is essentially a free masterclass for you guys to listen to. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jerome Crushon. 
I'd like to welcome to the show Jerome Croshan, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. It's it's been a I've I've seen you pass through my Facebook feed probably a thousand times, and I've heard about you and your course and and all the good work that you've done in the distribution space because there's not a lot of people in the distribution space that are trying to help filmmakers. And as I heard from somebody a long time ago who's in that space, by the time that filmmakers get to you, they're exhausted and broke. So. <laughs> <laughs> they're exhausted they're broken they're really really vulnerable and, Very much and so. they're so vulnerable that this is where 70 percent of them maybe higher get taken get, get, oh. get taken for a ride and they're screwed yeah and so we're, we're going to go deep into all of that today but before we get into that how did you get started in the film business um oh my lord well you know it's it's a long saga as it is for all of us um I started out as an actor many years ago, um, you know, got some work here and there, uh, always felt that I would eventually write and produce. And then one day I woke up and said, what, what, what am I waiting for? Why don't I just start? Um, cause I've been writing all along actually, just not in screenplay format. So, uh, wrote a couple sample scripts to get my feet wet with that formatting. Then, um, when I was happy with that, I wrote, a full length screenplay. Um, and then I sought to do it, to put it together the Hollywood way, package it with actors, mm -hmm. a director, etc. So I spent, um, two plus years doing that and actually not that long comparatively, but, but I spent time and I had some name actors involved, you know, who loved the script. And I had a name director at the time, a name director. Uh, I mean, not a big name director, but you know, like a B B plus director, mm -hmm. somebody not, that doesn't did, didn't do shit, but wasn't doing the, you know, hundred million dollar studio movies. Mm -hmm. So, um, then we tried to raise money. I tried to raise money and the director tried to help too. And we got it to a bunch of people, had a bunch of meetings, but we couldn't get it off the ground. And, and quite frankly, um, I don't know, maybe this is boring, but it was an ensemble piece. So there was not one or two actors that were going to be the sole leads. So the name talent we were attracting was people had names, but they weren't the big names and nobody wanted to take a risk, even with the package we were putting together. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead. What, and year, what year was this, by the way? Uh, in the 90s. Okay. 1990s. So when there was money, there was money. <laughs> there was money <laughs> and the independent, independent film scene was burgeoning. Sure. So I went ahead and I just, uh, you know, said if I didn't have the money by a certain date, I was going to shoot no matter what, with whatever I had. So I set a date that happened. There's a whole, you know, a lot of interesting things that happened along the way, uh, with, you know, not being able to now use the, the director who had some name. And I went to independent director, you know, people who had a lot of credits or a couple of credits, but they were indie so they their name wasn't and i went through three or four of them who cut would come and drop out or whatever reason finally got it off the ground shot it um went through post took me took me a few years to get through post-production actually because i didn't have the money for that mm -hmm. but i finally made that happen and then um bam i'm ready to hit the marketplace uh one of the mistakes that i made at the, at the starting gate was submitting the film to certain distributors who passed on it because there was no pedigree. First of all, there were no names. That's always a question I would get asked. And there was no pedigree. It was like, um, okay, you know, you know, it's a talking head slice of life picture with no names. So, um, I got passed on by everybody I'd submitted it to. Um, and I had just started doing festivals at the same time. So I decided, okay, screw it. Pull back, quit submitting to distributors. Nobody told me that. I just kind of figured it out. I won't do that till I kind of, you know, get some press on it, maybe some, win some awards if I'm lucky. So I kind of ended up building this whole pedigree thing, which nobody was, I think, really using the word pedigree mm -hmm. in relation to film. So I don't know if that I came up with it solely. I think there was maybe one other person in the industry who might have referred to films that way. Anyways, I either usurped his use of that word. Sure, uh, sure, sure. My own. Um, as, I, as, I, as I will now start using it as well. 
Absolutely. <laughs> you know, as a matter of fact, somebody else who's now just getting into the distribution arena, I think I saw a class somewhere or something advertised or whatever, a talk, and they actually used the word pedigree. And I was like, right on. I don't care if they stole it from me or not. The <laughs> fact that they're bringing it up and using it is important because filmmakers sure. don't even think about pedigree and what pedigree means mm -hmm. to your potential buyers. Anyways, mm -hmm. we'll get into that, I'm sure. So, uh, so anyways, long story short, I um, built this pedigree and then I started submitting it to distributors and I was getting a much different response now. And I really learned firsthand how the way you position a film, the way you put it out there to your potential buyers, it's night and day difference between the two. So um, anyways, I finally got distribution. Um, it took a while. There were, I actually might have come close to getting, you know, a specialty arm distribution because a couple of the big players were interested, but I didn't play that game right. And that's a whole game in and of itself mm -hmm. about how to utilize interest, leverage interest against one another. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do that right. S screwed that up. And, um, but anyways, I got distribution. It went out. I did some limited theatrical myself, and then uh, and then I got and then Warner Brothers released it uh, nationally. Um, no name comedy drama. Uh, that journey then led me to just writing some articles about film distribution for the magazines. I'd get called after I'd write an article. Someone would find my number and call me, or they'd email me, "Hey, Jerome, your story was inspiring. I'm lost. I don't know what to do." Um, and I started helping people, mm -hmm. Oops, just, just for free. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some of my colleagues, uh, you know, were finishing their films. Hey, Jerome, can you help us out? Can we? And by helping them out, they, two of them got distribution within four months of my talking to them and telling them what to do. And another one, it took them a year. Um, and then they were like, Jerome, you got to teach this. You got to share this. What you have is gold. Oh, my God. And I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, I'm not a teacher. Yeah. I teach, you know? I'm a film. I'm a filmmaker. I'm not a teacher. I mean, <laughs> yeah. those who yeah. teach don't do. I mean, seriously. Yeah, that's what I said. The same thing. There is that, and a lot of people <laughs> think that or feel yeah. that way. Right. So I was no, 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 and and then also I was like, yeah, but these are these are my secrets. These are these are the things that. Let me turn my phone off. Yeah. Um, these these are my secret sauce. Yeah. These, the, the, if I share this, it will lose value. Well, I don't know. One day it just occurred to me, well, you know, I don't believe in scarcity just as a concept. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but if we buy into it, then it does exist for us. Okay. Maybe this is a little, going to be a little out there philosophically, but mm -hmm. if I'm being generous, you know, in theory, uh, and spirituality or religion would say it will come back to you. So I just decided, what the hell, I'm just going to share. Created a class, shared what I knew, um, helped a lot of people. That turned into a one-day class. It was an evening class, turned into a one-day class, turned into a two-day class. And I've just kind of stayed with it the whole time with my projects, helping others that I know and helping those people that hire me. So that's kind of how I kind of backed into it, right? I backed. I didn't intend to be doing this. Um I'm really good at it. Um, I guess I'm like a, a film distribution whisperer, you know, mm -hmm. and then I just kind of get it and I know what you need to do. And I can look at a film and say, this film needs X, Y, and Z to have an audience or this film, here's the audience for this film. You got to do this or this is the right distributor or, you know, stay away from these guys over here. They're going to fuck you. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I probably. It's all good. It's all good. No, it's it's the realities of our business, sir. <laughs> it is. It is. And, you know, in this business, the distribution business is, um, you know, 70% of this end of the business, it's crooked. I'm sorry. It's just, it's just, it's just freaking crooked. Yeah. Um, I use the word predatory. Uh, predatory is, yeah. is, is another yeah. way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. It's predatory. Um, and, and like we, you know, and filmmakers are very vulnerable. Producers are very vulnerable, especially on their first few films. They're exhausted by the time it's done. They just want to move on. Right. You, it's, it's like, you know, I, I don't know. It, you know, I was going to say liken it to, you know, raising children, but 
I don't have any children, so I don't know what that. I wouldn't. I'm just speaking it's out kinda, of my butt. It's kind of kind, kind of like that. But the children that they don't go away. You don't. You don't. Uh, you don't just put them into distribution, and uh, and yeah. they're and they're a financial drain on the family. I'm just throwing that out there. As well. <laughs> <laughs> it takes years for them to actually put some some money back into our into the pockets. Yeah. But uh, but it could turn into something. Who knows? But I'm yeah. jo- I'm joking. I'm joking. Everybody out there, I'm joking. I have kids. This is. This is how I. This is my true feelings. No. Um, <laughs> all right. So you you said something very interesting though. Uh, pedigree. Can you explain what the your concept of pedigree is? Sure. So pedigree is simply. Look, you know, filmmakers out there, you make a movie. Who's going to like your movie? Your family, your friends, right. people who personally know you. Even if your movie's not good or great. They're not going to most likely trash it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Or maybe some of your friends, maybe who are jealous, might trash it. But you know, or they might uh, trash it to your face, but they'll you know behind your back. Um, So people who know you personally are always going to be a little more favorable than the average person who doesn't know you. Um, And so, without getting too deep into that concept and social media and every you know all that stuff. You need to, as a, as a producer, needs to create this profile. Pedigree is a profile, a positive profile on your film of what others are saying or what that film can do. So here's some examples of pedigree. First of all, if you have names in your movie, that's, pe- that's automatic pedigree. You automatically start with pedigree. Oh, I've got, I don't know, Christina Applegate or... I've got George Clooney or whatever. Okay, great. People are going to watch your film only because of that. And mm-hmm. that, so, so pedigree is what is it going to, what, what is it that people, why will people watch your film? So it's, it's names. And if you don't have names, then did you win awards at film festivals? That's really important. And I know there's a lot of people in Hollywood who poo poo that and say, ah, you know, come but on. It, but it also depends on genre, wouldn't you say? Because certain genres, film festival, pedigree means something like if it's a drama or but if it's like a slapstick comedy or a straight up horror film i don't think that audience really cares that much if it won best picture at scream fest okay um yeah well okay um so this is that's a great question and i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna go into it go into it yeah because there's two there's two reasons we i pedigree is important one is yes and no, it is and isn't important, and another is it is important, depending upon what you want to do with the film. So Correct. yeah. Correct. So if and if I don't get if I somehow don't get back to that, you'll bring mm-hmm. me back in. Sure, sure, sure. So, uh all right, so awards if you can win them, uh press articles. So one thing that a lot of filmmakers don't do is they get accepted to film festivals. Now, if it's a tiny little festival or it's only in its first couple of years and the media doesn't pay attention, no matter what town it's in. Well, you know, you're not probably going to get any press, but but if it's at least something that's been around for a while and there are even independent press that will cover it, you got to get some press articles because what you're going to do is you're you're building a press kit for the film. And you're building a you're going to build you build a crescendo of people talking and writing about your film. So when people are talking and writing about your film, the subconscious or subliminal message is you have something valuable. You have something worth talking about. And while this sounds simplistic or like, is it really that important? Yes, it's freaking important because sales. All right, here's, here's, the, here's the bottom line truth. Films are no different than anything else, any other commodity in the marketplace. Okay. A film is no different than this coffee cup. Mm-hmm. Coffee cup has an intrinsic value, $2, $10, whatever it is. But the value is it's useful to me. Movies are not useful to people. They're only entertainment. So you've got to make your movie appear useful to someone, useful as either an entertainment, something to spend two hours on and have fun, or if it's a documentary or a social issue, something or a narrative movie that has a social issue, a serious issue in it, that makes your that can make your film important and important to the level that it's something you that my audience needs to see because it's going to open your eyes. It's going to change 
the world in some way, or it might change the world in some way. You know, Al Gore is an inconvenient truth. A lot of people laugh about that film today. I mean, well, depending on one's politics. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That film actually really launched a serious conversation that even though that conversation seemed to go away for a while, it was the start of a serious conversation that we are full blown in today about climate change. So anyway, so um, and and if you've got uh, critics um, now getting reviews at a film festival is really hard to do. But let's say the festival programmer writes up, you know, something about your film and says wonderful movie or whatever. Well, you know what? That's a quote. Wonderful movie and the person's name and their attribution. Um, if you're playing at, let's say, I don't know, the Chicago International Film Festival, you may get reviewed in the actual one of the daily papers there. Or you'll be written up and about, you know, the festival and they'll talk mm-hmm. about a few films. If your film is one of those films and the critic watched it and says something about it, pedigree. So all of this stuff does two things. One. It can help your audience decide whether or not to to actually invest 90 minutes or two hours into your film. Um, And two, let's say you want a distributor. You're not going to do a DIY Mm -hmm. approach, a do-it-yourself approach. Um, If you want a distributor, having a press kit, physical and or EPK, that shows all this coverage of your film and how good it is, makes them salivate. It Mm -hmm. makes them salivate. You are telling them, you're communicating to them, I have a valuable, this is a valuable project, this is a valuable movie, and they think, oh, I can make money with this. That's all you want a distributor to think is, oh, I can make money with this, if you're going after a distributor. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, and if you're going after the audience, like a DIY approach, then you need to convince your audience in this country, in America, uh, everywhere, spend 90 minutes with me. You're going to be entertained or you're going to be, you're going to learn something or that this is worth 90 minutes of your time. Mm -hmm. Now, would you, so obviously actors do bring that pedigree and it it brings, they bring their audience with them. So, you know, fans of George Clooney or Christina Applegate or Will Smith or something, People who, right. who know their history and know their work will be fans of what they do, and then they will go and watch this movie. And that's a, a kind of a deal that actors make with their audience. So, so that's, that's why when like comedians jump into a drama, and like, wait a minute, that is not what we know you for. We want to laugh with you, Robin Williams. We don't want you to be do serious movies. But then when he does serious movies so well, they're like, well, okay, this is a new thing. But there is a kind of unwritten social contract that a, an actor has with his audience. Is that fair to say? I would say that's fair to say. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, this is an example from, from many years ago, but, um, well, quite a few years ago when, um, Colin O'Brien was going to do, and I don't think this was his first live tour, but Mm -hmm. it was an early live tour and he was on Twitter and he had a million or 2 million followers. So, you know, somewhat the early days of Twitter and he want, and he set up this whole tour across the live across the country. And he tweeted out once or twice and every single show in every single city filled up, sold out mm-hmm. based on a couple of tweets. And, and that got a lot of press and everybody's like, Oh, you gotta be on, if you're famous, you gotta be on Twitter. Look what it'll do for you. All this kind of stuff. So yes, there is a social contract that if you like what I do or who I am, uh, I'm going to just give you more of that. So buy a ticket. Right. So, so that's what we, that's what you're buying into with uh, with with actors. Now, uh, when you're saying pedigree film festivals uh, definitely have that uh, articles and, and write in any kind of press you did. Like when I did my first short film, I was in 180, 200 film festivals. I was reviewed wow. by Roger Ebert. I was reviewed by nice. 200 news outlets. This is a short film with no stars in it. And I and I leveraged it, not knowing what the term pedigree was, but I was adding pedigree because I knew that there was nothing inherent about my 20-minute short film that people would pay money for. Right. So that I created this kind of um, image or kind of like a vibe of the film that people were like, well, wait a minute, if – Roger Ebert wrote about him and like, I have to go see this movie. And then I created other product lines and things like that to sell the movie. But 
in today's world, I mean, I, I agree with you 100% that films should get pedigree, but if you're going after a distributor, which there's an inherent problem, which 70% of them are crooks, so that's a, that's a conversation to be had. Or if you're going to go down the DIY aspect of things, how important is, like, I, I know film festivals in the 90s had so much power. You know, putting Sundance on your film, and today even, if you put Sundance on your film, there is a definite pedigree. But it's not an automatic like it used to be. Like before when you won Sundance or were you even in Sundance, you just got distribution. Checks would flow from distributors purely because of it. Those days are not here anymore. Would you agree with that? Or they're different at least? They're, they're different. I, I would say they're different. So, so um, Yeah, don't get me wrong. If I could get into Sundance and win it, uh, yes. <laughs> absolutely, because you'll, you'll get a deal of some kind. Something, um, something, maybe. And that's not guaranteed. Well – if you win an award, you're probably going to get a deal at Sundance. Uh, I, I worked on a film in 2010 that they won two awards at Sundance and they did not get a deal uh, because of the kind of film it was. So there was – there's. I mean it's a case-by-case case basis. That's would, true. Uh, that, yeah. that, that's true. It is a case – I agree. It is a case-by-case case basis and, and, I, and I probably should not make you know, a, 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 a no exception rule here. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course. But you know, there are a handful of festivals that um, – that if you get into mean will something. mean something serious, mean something significant, mm -hmm. and possibly lead to you getting a, an actual reputable deal, a deal where there's a check written, et cetera, and, mm -hmm. and they hand you your film. Now, one of the things that I talk about in my course, mm -hmm. um, my 18-hour course, is and live and I talk about this in live classes too so I'll I'll talk about it here briefly um <clears throat> if you're in if you get accepted to let's say one of the top 3 film festivals in in the world and those are Sundance Toronto and Cannes um <clears throat> if you're in one of those <clears throat> excuse me you have to set the stage oh yeah and 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 basically Create an aura, an environment where buzz can happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you just go, and a lot of people don't understand this, filmmakers don't, aren't marketing experts, so I get it. We all, you know, we know that, and so they're a little weak on this. But if you get into Sundance, you're mm -hmm. not, if you just, oh, great, I'll, I'll show up at Sundance and I'll sit in my first screening. Well, this be great. I'll be over. I'm going to be a rock star. Uh, I, got, I got to choose between the $10 million offer and the $20 million offer. That's yeah. that's going to be the, the, the problems I have at my, my right. festival. <laughs> and so you don't do anything. <clears throat> you don't uh, uh, You don't get a producer rep. And by the way, I hate producer reps and they're useless for most films. And we can talk about that later if you want. But in, in the case of Sundance, if you and I'm talking about maybe one of the handful of important or reputable, reputable, important producer reps, if you don't have one of those who helps you build the buzz before the screening mm -hmm. or one of the sales agents from one of the top agencies in Hollywood mm -hmm. or, you know, there, there are a lot of things that one has to do. What you want to do is create buzz about your film before it plays at Sundance. I'm talking mm -hmm. weeks before. Sure. A month before when, when the films are announced. Mm -hmm. And if one does that, and there's a lot of different ways to do that, then when you go, all the acquisitions representatives from all the major distributors will be at your first screening. Mm -hmm. If buzz happened on your film before that, they're going to be there. Mm -hmm. That'll be their top on their list of what they got to see. It'll be at the top of the list. And if they are, and if you built this buzz, they're going to be there and a deal is going to happen. Mm hmm most likely what filmmakers don't understand is they don't understand that game and the psychological process, the psychology that happens at film festivals like that, where buyers will buy stuff, even if the film isn't great because their competitors are aiming to get it too. Mm -hmm. So this is why <clears throat> in the nutshell version, this is why a lot of films that get bought at Sundance or in the past were bought at Sundance and then they get released theatrically and they kind of die at the box office and the general public goes, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a great film. Well, no, but in an environment like Sundance, you had five different companies going after it and they were all trying to get the film because it's right. the case and it's the, I want this film and it plays so well here. I'm going to make money with it. Well, mm -hmm. you know, film festival audiences are not exactly, you can't, 
look at a film festival audience and say, okay, the rest of America is going to respond this way. That's a whole other issue. What was, it, what was that movie that got sold to, uh, I forgot, the, I think it was Fox Searchlight. It, it was the record. Five, it was $11 million. It was the slave movie, the slave rebellion movie. And it just, uh, it died. It died. Uh, 12 years as a slave? No, 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 no. That was not that. That 12 years as a slave. There was another one. Exactly. You don't even remember, but it won Sundance uh, and was sold. It was oh. a record. It was a record sell. This happened like maybe three, four years ago. But it was a perfect example of that bidding war mentality where it was $11 million purchase and it died. I think uh, Nate, uh, the guy who was the director, there was a scandal about. Uh, birth, a, of a, a, birth of a nation. There it is. Birth of birth a nation. Of a nation. That yeah. one. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So that's a perfect example of what you're talking about, of like this kind of thing of everybody. I need to have this movie, but it ended up not doing very well. Well, yeah, and this this scandal didn't help. But did not did not help. But unfortunately, when you spend a little million dollars, there's no way to vet that situation. So it was a huge risk. You, like how how could a Fox Searchlight even known if it was Fox Searchlight? But how would have a company known spending eleven million dollars that this was around the corner, so it it killed that movie, sure. you know, which sure. is un, which is unfortunate. But I have a question for you. So I, I understand this concept was for the top three film festivals, or even South by, or maybe Tribeca. There's a few top tier festivals that mean something uh, in the in the in the zeitgeist of of absolutely of movie goers' eyes. Like Tribeca is a name, South by is a name. There's a handful. There's not many. There's Ven- there's Venice, there's Berlin. There's a handful. Correct. But. That is for like the top 1% of 1% of filmmakers. What happens for the rest of us? Okay, How can- well, this, is, this is why pedigree, this is why I, <clears throat> you know, will talk till I'm blue in the face about pedigree. Because <clears throat> if you can't get into one of the top festivals, and you're right, Tribeca and South by, South by Southwest are in, I would put those at four and five, respective, mm-hmm. you know, sure. well, Tribeca and then South by. Um, Seattle, you know, I probably throw Seattle in there. Um, you know, Austin. Film Fest. I'll throw a few others in the Venice, top. Berlin. Yeah, Venice, Berlin. Yeah. Yeah. Tell your ride. Tell, Tell your ride. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's a, a handful. Very no- notable pickups in the past. Mm-hmm. Juno was discovered at Tell your ride. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Um, so this is why you know. And most, you're right. Most filmmakers are not going to get into the top festivals. So what do you do? Okay, you go to the second tier festivals and you build the pedigree through the second tier festivals, um, and. You know, let's talk about because I didn't get back to that one. The the why you know is that are, are awards important or not, and mm-hmm. and who are they important for to? for genre depending on the genre, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and, and you look, you know, if you've got a horror film, you don't need ten awards. You don't need a lot. You know, if you've got a good horror film with no names in it, fine. There's an audience for that. You know, it's a genre film. Genre films don't need pedigree necessarily because people will watch it regardless. Because it's genre, it's a built in, the, the, the genre itself is the pedigree almost. It's yeah. almost the audience that's going to yeah. watch it regardless. And horror is infamously very yeah. forgiving. That yeah. audience will watch almost anything. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's a built in audience for genre films. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just when it comes to comedies with no names, dramas with no names, comedy dramas, romantic comedies, coming of age, mm-hmm. any of that stuff. Period pieces. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Period pieces. Exactly. Anything that's not genre, <clears throat> documentaries, you know, anything not genre needs help. Um, so I. <clears throat> so if you build pedigree through the second tier and third tier film festivals. I mean, there really are. Tiers. Tier. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, what you're basically doing is, is, is you're, you're setting yourself apart. You're doing a number of things. One we've already talked about pedigree for the purposes of, you know, uh, the other is that you are setting yourself apart from the 5,000 other independent movies that are made every year. Every year there's 5,000 plus movies being mm-hmm. made. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if your movie is in the marketplace, you're trying to get distribution for two years. Now you're up against 10,000 new movies, not just 5,000. So it, it's kind of a festivals are often seen as a curation process mm-hmm. by distribution executives. Um, and so if you show up at their door with a film that won five awards or one award, but it's got all this great press versus the the person that shows up with nothing, a little DVD in an envelope or, you know, a, a, link, a link to their, a private Vimeo link to where they can see the screener. Well, if, if you're if you're in the business to make money, which are you going to look at first to make a decision? 
Of I'm going to look. I'm going to look at the one that's come with press and or awards and or oh, you know, I mean, my time is valuable. I'm going to look at that before I look at that. And that over there is a pile that grows, and it'll get to, maybe. but it won't. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. It'll, get to, it'll get to by the secretary of the secretary, right? Uh, who may not be in a good mood that day. So your your independent comedy doesn't make your laugh, and she's like, "What the? No, I pass." And her boss goes, "Fine, send out the pass letter, whatever." Um, you know, you're going to look at the stuff that looks like, "Wow, this might be something here," and so. <clears throat> So it's a curation process and distribution people look, they're, they're, they're buyer, they're, they're salespeople, but they're buyers and they understand what sells. So if you have, um, I'll probably digress a little bit, but if you've got a title that's interesting and you've got a movie poster that looks good, um, those are two of your most important assets, um, along with building pedigree to get people to say yes to you distribution people or eventually your audience. Um, and I don't know how much we want to get into the movie poster, sure. but, but a lot, a lot of, a lot of filmmakers, they just throw things together. Oh yeah. They, I, I, I constantly preach. I'm like, hire a, an editing, a, a trailer editor, please. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you've edited for 20 years, doesn't mean you're a trailer editor. There's a, it's a specific art form to trailer editing. There's and, and if you're going to spend, go, go to 99 designs, and get a poster, get a bunch of great graphic designers who understand movie posters to bid against each other and design yeah. and design something for you at the lowest end. At the highest end, spend 500 to 1000 bucks on a guy or girl to design a real movie poster who has credits doing a movie poster. Because it is immensely important. It is what people see. I always tell people that trailers and the poster are seen by much more people that will ever see your movie. That's and it's right. so 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 important, and it will be the driving factor in so many ways. Now, I right. do, and I do agree with you in regards to things that can set your movie apart. So pedigrees, pedigree meaning actors set your movie apart. If I've got Brad Pitt in my five hundred thousand dollar independent movie, I promise you, someone's going to look at it because of the pedigree that Brad Pitt brings to the to the table. Every, everyone will look at it. It, it. Everybody was like, "How the hell did you do this?" And then that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but, um, but. Um, but so if either actors um, or or pedigree, meaning um, press, festivals possibly, depending on genre. Uh, and then also just genre itself is a pedigree depending on what you're trying to sell. If it's action, if it's sci-fi, if it's right. horror, uh, that's another thing that makes you set apart uh, in regards to the marketplace. Now, we've been focusing a lot on distributors and trying to get bought and sold uh, to distributors um, let's not talk about sales agents because I, I agree with you on sales agents. Um, there, I do believe there are some good producers reps out there that do some good work, but generally speaking, it, it's they're they're unicorns. They're unicorns without question. Yeah, and 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 they're just they're <clears throat> not to distract from your train of thought, but you know, a lot of producer reps look. <clears throat> you know, I don't know why people still think they're so valuable or they're so important. I mean, they just, they just aren't except in some very selective situations. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, uh, exactly. I, I mean, mean, when we, when we spoke off air, I told you, I'm like, Oh, there's this one producer rep that ripped me off. And you're like, Oh, it's this person. I'm like, well, how did you know? <laughs> because, because everybody knows that's what they did. So, yeah. uh, you know, that was num ep by the way, I think it's episode three or four of this podcast, which was like, why producers reps suck and how they're going to rip you off. Like, it, I mean, I've, I've been on this boat for a long time. I was taken for you, almost 10 grand. <laughs> you and I brother. And, and you know what I, I, yeah, I absolutely, it's, <laughs> it's, it, you know, and, and I, I understand that a lot of filmmakers are like, they don't understand the game. They don't know they can just pick up the phone and call and, you know, or they get blocked by, you know, one screening person on the phone who says, well, who you want to speak to? I'm sorry. If you don't have a name, we can't speak to you. Goodbye. I mean, you know, and they think, oh, my God, everybody's like that. No. You know, I, I just just last week or the week before someone's like, hey, I can't get through to distributors. I'm like, who are you trying to reach? Everybody. I can get through to anybody. He goes and he said and he talks about the movie studios and the TV networks. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> well, I'll call NBC up and go, hey, do you want to buy my movie for, you know, no. That's not yeah, the <laughs> he's calling the wrong people. And, and then he's extrapolating that to mean everybody. I mean, there's, you know, there's hundreds of distributors distributors here. Anyway. Yeah. Um, All right. So, so, so we're focusing a lot on, uh, or what you've been talking about is focusing on being purchased by a distributor, which is more of a traditional legacy 
model yeah. of, of buying movies. And that's what has worked for many, many, well, I won't say the word worked. It's the way things have been done for many, many years. Right. And I do believe that there's obviously a place for film distributors uh, now and in the future as part of a holistic ecosystem for filmmakers moving forward. But right. with that said, how can you protect yourself as a filmmaker from these predatory um, film distributors? Because I mean, I, I just put out a podcast talking about how nobody really knows what's going on in the in the distribution space because everyone's just trying to figure out the market now because what worked before was DVD was the thing. Now DVD is gone. Then TVOD was a thing, and TVOD is really not generating the kind of revenue it used to be. Now it's SVOD and AVOD is where it's a lot of money. So f- there's so many – there's so much shifting going on that that's, yeah. these distributors don't even know – how to deal with it. So how do you, first of all, protect yourself from it? And moving forward, how can we actually generate any revenue? <laughs> all right. That, those are good questions. Um, in terms of how to protect yourself, please, uh, please. One, one of the things that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of shakeout that's been going on for a long time in the distribution business. It's like, I, I would say, I don't know that things have really settled down since the digital revolution. Um, I, you know, when DVD started going down, that's when things kind of got complicated for distributors. And I don't think even to this point today that they, that, you know, a lot of them have gone out of business. You know, if I look at the list of who was a sales company, uh, uh, I'll just talk about the international sales agencies. We, We call, you know, we call them foreign sales agents or international sales companies that sell worldwide outside the U.S. and Canada. If we look at the list of all those who existed 20 years ago, more than half of them are gone. Probably mm-hmm. two thirds of them or more are gone. Um, so <clears throat> there's always new companies coming into the into the marketplace to try their hand at the game, and if they don't succeed in the first couple of years, they're gone. And what do you do if you've made a deal with them and your rights are tied up with that company? Um, so one of the things that there's a lot of things we we can do to protect ourselves. One is to uh, do due diligence on any distributor or any company that you are considering making a deal with. Mm-hmm. And the due diligence means you're going to call up. Um, I know other people now talk about this, or if you do, um, one of our colleagues does as well. But I, I was the only one talking about this for a long time. Not due diligence in and of itself, but how you do it is you call up a minimum of three producers of movies that have been with that distributor for at least one year. Okay. That have been in the marketplace for at least Mm -hmm. one. Okay. Um, and you can do more than three and you track these people down. You don't ask the distributor. Can I have references? (laughs) They're only going to give you their friends or the people who they performed really well with, who are going to give them glowing reports. And those are going to be anomalies. Um, more than likely. So you just pick out, and there's ways to you know figure out how film how long films have been with a company. And IMD and IMDb is a perfect resource for that. IMDb Pro. First of all, I, you know Amazon. You go to Amazon and you look for the release date. You make sure it's been at least a, out in the marketplace at least a year, and then you can go to IMDb Pro and track down the producer. Or if they're not there, you've got Facebook. You find them on Facebook. You find mm-hmm. them on Twitter. You direct message them. You find them on Instagram. They're out there. It's very rare to find a producer today who doesn't have any online profile at all. Right. Um, and then will they answer you? You know, most of the time they will. Once in a while they won't, you know. Um, but fine. If you can't get an answer from one, you move on to the next. So you got to protect yourself by doing due diligence. The second thing is the contract that, act, that, that, that filmmakers and producers make, those contracts. Um, and if I go on too long with this answer, you can cut me off. I, I will, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you're going to get a boilerplate contract from a distributor. Mm-hmm. That boilerplate contract is going to be in their favor. Always. It's the way it is. It's okay. good. That's business. It's it, as a business. You, many times you have to your, your own yeah. interest. As the nature of any business. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna skew things to your favor. Exactly. Exactly. So. You just have to know that doesn't mean they're crooked. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but it's going to be in their favor. And your job as a good, savvy producer is to 
get that is to negotiate that contract and to go and you'll have to go through a red line, what we call a red line process. You're going to negotiate the contract to at least at the very minimum be neutral, no more favorable to the distributor and no more favorable to you. That's a minimum. If you can get it favorable to you, freaking great. And, and that's the negotiation process. And so distributors, they understand this. They understand the game. They know the business. If they, if they get a filmmaker who comes to them and the distributor gives them the boilerplate and the filmmaker signs it without negotiation, they know they have a sucker on their hands. And you're going to get ripped off most likely mm -hmm. because that contract is it, it's just not good for you. If I, um, if I could if I could tell a story, uh, yeah. there's a there's a there is a specific distributor who will remain nameless, but we all know who that distributor is. They work it very heavily in the independent space. They put out 40, 50 movies a month, which is a whole other conversation we could talk about. And uh, I had a friend of mine who had a horror movie who's I think now in a hundred some festivals, like he's doing, uh, he's going hard in the festival circuit. He's right. won tons of awards. Uh, and it was a small movie, you know, it's a micro budget film, but he's done very, very well. He's And he's already made money with it and all that kind of good stuff. He called me up and he goes, here's uh, the contract that this company gave me. And I looked at the contract, 15 years, 15 years, $100,000. Actually, it was, a, the two, no, it was, I think it was $200,000 marketing cap 200 marketing uh, for marketing cap in there and uh, I, I mean just those two things alone was enough and I said no and I always call it if you sign this you're making a non a non deductible tax a non tax deductible donation to this company like that's all, you're you're giving your movie away you'll never see a dime from this movie so that's when you're talking about boilerplate contracts they'll throw out like let's see if they'll sign this 15 year thing i and that's that's interesting that you mentioned that example and i don't know if it's the same company but yeah i i have seen i i have seen contracts one in particular from a company that um <clears throat> shall we name nameless uh <laughs> remain nameless and um yeah there was a two hundred thousand dollar recoupable. Oh, in the contract. oh okay. God. yeah. And not only that, not only that, there was a penalty clause in the pair in the Ooh. contract. Okay. And the penalty clause went like this: If you make a deal outside of our jurisdiction, uh, without us being part of that deal, um, and they, I think that was a worldwide right, so they had everything. If you make a deal and we are not part of that deal, you will be penalized a, get this, $200,000 penalty. So wow. the guy signed this agreement. Oh, he gave it away. Attorney look at it. It was not a client of mine. I mean, I would have not have let him, have had let mm -hmm. him sign that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it came to me through a colleague of ours. And I'm like, Wow. What I'm sorry. What an idiot! You don't, don't ever filmmakers don't ever fucking sign any goddamn distribution agreement without a good attorney reviewing it. And when I say that, I'm really passionate about. Oh, uh, you should. When I say that, not your cousin, divorce attorney. Yes, not yes. Your, not your third cousin who real does estate. Business. Who does real estate attorney? Yeah, yeah. Real estate. Okay. You need an entertainment attorney, and that entertainment attorney, and you have to qualify them, has to really understand distribution, distribution today. And so you have to qualify that before you hire them. And, and it's if, not that much, though. I mean, we're talking about what to get it's like 500 bucks, 700 bucks tops to an entertainment yeah. attorney to look over a contract. It's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. in yeah. the I grand mean, scope it, of the movie. It'll be two to three, two to four hours, okay? Right, um, right. Whatever. I, I mean, and if an attorney wants, will only work with like you got to send me a five thousand dollar retainer before I look. No, 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 no it no. doesn't cost five thousand to have no. your agreement reviewed. Yeah, fifteen hundred bucks, under fifteen hundred bucks is generally a good a good price. I, I'd agree with that. I agree yeah. with that. Um, so, you know, I, I think that. It's really important to 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 you know take this to heart and and for the folks out there you know hearing this for the first time and most likely those 
entertainment attorneys who really understand distribution, you're not going to find them in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find them in Boise, Idaho. You're, you know, you're just not, and I no disrespect to any entertainment attorneys who there are some in various disparate parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Most likely you're going to find them only in LA, maybe New York. I'd say, uh, you know, it depends on who in New York. There's, there's but, some in New York, possibly Chicago, maybe, but that's arguably New York and LA. LA is going to be the best, the best place. I, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't hire, I, I'm from Chicago, love Chicago. I wouldn't hire an entertainment attorney to review my distance. I, I would, I would agree with, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. So, so, you know, you've got to go with someone who's in the mix, looking at this stuff all the time, seeing how things change, how terms may change and be defined. Um, so, yeah, so. That's that's a way to protect yourself uh, as well. Um, and then the other thing in which you brought up. Don't sign a 15 year deal, anybody. Don't, don't, mm -hmm. You don't, don't 15 years. Are you crazy? Your movie is going to make the most amount of money it will probably make in the first couple of years. Yeah. OK, two, three years. Yeah. Can it make, continue to make money? Yes, it can. It can on Amazon Prime. It can in other places. Depends on the profile, the movie, who's in it, does someone in it who's a no-name become a name, they get on a TV series and they're a regular on a TV series, sure. are you doing marketing every once in a while for the hell of it? I mean, there's a lot of things that can cause your movie to continue to make money. But, so the first couple of years, don't sign 15-year deals. Just don't do it. Um, have clauses in the agreement that, here's an example, if the country a country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if the company goes belly up, mm -hmm. they file bankruptcy, they go out of business. Or purchased. It, or purchased. Or purchased. And that's another, it's a separate, separate mm -hmm. scenario for that. But the first three, there should be a clause in your agreement that if they file bankruptcy, if they go out of business, the rights automatically, automatically revert back to you. So they're not tied up in a bankruptcy case. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not an attorney, and there may be some attorneys out there who will say, well, Jerome, you know, there, you know, it might depend on state law. And I don't know if you can do that because blah, 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 state law, bankruptcy laws and various, but whatever. I mean, yeah, I demand that my clients have that in the agreement. Mm -hmm. We put that in the agreement, and that agreement gets signed. And it's passed muster by my attorney or my client's attorney. Uh, and it passes muster by the distribution company, whether they agree with it or not, they'll accept it when I'm done negotiating, if mm -hmm. I'm negotiating with them. So that's got to be in there because otherwise the company is going to go out of business at some point in the future, possibly. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to get your rights back? That money goes into a black hole. If it's a bankruptcy, that money goes into a pile of money that the creditors you know, descend upon and mm -hmm. cents on the dollar and blah, blah, blah. All right. So in, in today's world, would you agree that a lot of the stuff we've laid out is with distrib distribution companies yeah. buying your movie? If in today's world, I found, at least from my experience and from uh, and just from my walking about in my walk about through this business and just dealing with talking to people and talking to filmmakers and hearing these stories, I find that the distributors right now it is a buyer's market because is. there is so much content out there yeah. that they will just throw out these ridiculous deals and go. If you don't want it, there's ten other horror movies walking down the street this yeah. hour. Yeah. That will sign the deal, and if yep. you don't like it, I don't want to deal with you. So yep. the, there's a lot. There's a lot of. What do you suggest for filmmakers like that? Because like, like if I can't really negotiate the deal, and and if you have no other options, what do you do? Well, okay, I don't know about the no other options. Uh, no, no, there's plenty of other options, but there's I'm just. Always, yeah. But is but is there? There's always another distributor. There's always somebody else who will give you a deal. But yeah. is it going to be a favorable deal? Are you going to be able to generate any revenue with that? Like, is well, I don't believe I don't believe that filmmakers and producers should be making deals that are that are not going to be favorable. Um, now, right. the, you know, when when a client comes to me and says, "Okay, Jerome, here's what I got, and here's what I want," the what I want is really important. I want to know what their goal is, what they need to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, because some filmmakers may come. I do have some people who, who come to me and say, okay, I, I, I have a mortgage on my house 
and I need to generate this amount of money. And either it's realistic or it's not, you know, and then we'll talk about that. Some people I have had, believe it or not, I've had some people come to me and go, Jerome, I don't care if I make any money on this or not. I want the most number of people in the world to see it because it's an important film or it's got an important message. Correct. And I go, great, great. Okay. Well, there's a whole different strategy mm -hmm. and a different, you know, group of people that we might talk to, uh, traditional distributors or a DIY approach, you know, putting it up on the platforms and making it free or available or, you know, whatever. I mean, so I, we have, we look at their goal now in terms of, um, In terms of, and I just lost the rest of your question. I, uh, in regards to not having any other options, uh, and I, I do agree with what you're saying, like uh, because every film and every filmmaker has different goals. It could be money, it could be exposure, it could right. be a bunch of different things. But if there is no other option on the distribution standpoint, or at, like I, I don't know, it's it's a tough question to answer. I can't even answer it myself. Like it's just like. You're running against the wall because there's so much, it's such a buyer's market. Where do you go? What do you do? Well, all right. So, yeah. So, so I think what I wanted to say is I, I have, you know, a, a number of years ago <clears throat> on one of my own projects. Here's how I, I'll give you two examples. Mm -hmm. A number of years ago on one of my own projects, I was about to make a deal with a, with a foreign sales company uh, out, out of England uh, to handle the film for the world outside of us and Canada. And, we were in the middle of negotiation of a contract that I'd gotten and the, the, the owner or the head guy was not avail frequently available, which made me a little uncomfortable because mm -hmm. he was the one I started talking to. He's the one that gave me the contract and he put some like, you know, secretary in charge to interface with me to go through. Mm -hmm. the and Everything that I would say, the guy would go, okay, um, yeah, I'm making notes here. I'll have to talk to so-and-so and get back to you. And after a couple of times of this, which really annoyed me, because if the, the decision maker was on the phone, we could just hammer it out right then and there. After a couple of those, the guy says to me, listen, the boss says you have to make a decision and we have to make this sign this agreement by Friday or the deal's off. Now, hmm. Uh, I didn't like that. That's not the way that I do business when it comes to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a pressure tactic. It's a make the deal I'm offering you or, you know, goodbye. And you know what I said? I said goodbye. Mm -hmm. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. Bullshit. Okay. Yeah. You're going to play that kind of a pressure tactic uh, when we can't come to agreement on certain things in the agreement. I'm going to get screwed. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's – I don't want to – I know anybody out there, you get to Sundance and you've got five acquisitions people after you and they're pressuring you and whatnot. It's a different situation. Please don't apply what I just said to that situation. It's totally different. Right? Yeah, and because that that is pressure. Like, look, we're going to give you $5 million. Sign it now and your movie, your movie costs – Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Um, <laughs> right. Sign this deal now. That's a different conversation to have, and we, I hope we all one day have these problems. But right. generally, <laughs> like, should I take five million or seven million for my Sundance yeah. winning film? I really don't know. These don't are know. these are first world filmmaking problems. How uh, many, Fifty <laughs> screens versus a hundred screens. Jeez. I don't know. I don't uh, know. Uh, mm. I don't, uh, <laughs> Now, the other thing that happened recently, yeah. this happened like um, last year, and it was on behalf of a client, so all names and name of company will remain nameless, mm -hmm. but the deal on the table was that the company wanted worldwide rights. Mm -hmm. We really only wanted to parcel out the international rights and keep domestic, but the way the deal would have been structured was it would need a theatrical release which they would pay for in a certain number of theaters. And then it would result in a very profitable sale to a very important international territory. Mm -hmm. um, and when we ran the numbers, when we were given what that number would be and the costs involved and the distributor's fee and the recoupable expense that mm, they were. It's massive, I'm sure we ran the numbers, we would have been at a net zero 
or maybe up ten to twenty thousand dollars. Okay, and now we did have the rest of the world to sell. I mean, the company would, and we had. Uh, sorry, that's my mail thing. Two and months. then we also had um, the rest of America. I mean, the company would have the rights, but after theatrical, we've got mm -hmm. VOD. Yeah, 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 yeah. So potential upside all the way around the block. The client said no. My client said no. I don't need ten to twenty thousand dollars out of this. We still are going to have to market this thing domestically. We're still going to have to do marketing uh, for VOD. Where's the money going to come from then for that? You know, ten to twenty thousand isn't going to cut it if we even have that. Um, now, this distributor, this sales company, was not a crooked one. They have a I think a fairly reputable reputation. Mm -hmm. The client said, I'm not happy with this. I said, I don't blame you. Let's move on. We walked away. Now we actually did say we did come back. I mean, we had a couple of counters and one of them was, listen, why don't we make the deal <clears throat> and we'll give you X, Y, Z and you just let us have this. And the guy was like, no, no, I, I need worldwide and I'm not negotiable on the recoupable expense amount. Well, then we walked away. Bye. That bye. Bye. Yeah. That, yeah. What do we do next? Well, you know, you know, then there's then always, we, there's always another place to yeah. do it. But so would you agree that a lot of times these distributors will, will ask for worldwide, but they're not particularly good at selling worldwide. No. They just want them. So like their yeah. maybe their strength is in their contacts are U S and Canada and North America, right. but right. they'll go, I want worldwide because I just want it. And I could just maybe, Oh, I, I know a guy maybe in England or maybe somebody in Germany I worked with once, but the rest of the world is really not going to, you're, it, you know, or there's a, or the opposite is that distributor right. is excellent internationally, but really right. doesn't have a strong connection here in, in the States. So, yeah. Would you? I always, I always, you know, advise my clients as well is to, if you can piecemeal it out, if you can carve up rights and and, and literally from SVOD, AVOD, TVOD, you know, being able to sell it on your own website. It all depends on the movie. Depends on what what the recoups, what what, what money you need to. Like if it's just a three, four, five million dollar movie, th different conversation than yeah. a fifty to three hundred thousand dollar movie. Sure, it's a different conversation. So would you recommend? And how would you recommend? carving up rights um and and how distributors deal with that because in today's world there's a lot of a lot of distributors who are realizing they're like dude you don't know anything about svod tvod or avod you're just gonna go through an aggregator which we will get to in a second okay uh, <laughs> 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 you can, you're just gonna go to the same aggregator that i'm gonna go to but you're just gonna take 30 or 40 percent out of off my off my top so why would i give you those rights unless you have a direct relationship or there's some some special deal or you have you know, how many territories are you going to get on Amazon? Are you going to get the same three that I can get by just uploading it to Amazon Video Direct? Are your per hour SVOD numbers any much different than the ones that I would get if I just uploaded it directly? Or do you have automatically 68 territories around the world with favorable, you know, SVOD number, you know, a per hour number that I can't get because you have a relationship? Do you see what I'm saying? So yeah, what, what's your what's your opinion? Well, um, and, and I'm glad you bring this up because I actually have two articles – that deal exactly with this mm -hmm. at my mm -hmm. website. Okay. Um, okay. So the website is for those of you who've never heard of it before, or heard of me before. You'll find you'll find two articles under the left hand column where it says free stuff. Mm -hmm. It's where articles and some previous videos, interviews, and all sorts of stuff is there. It's all free. Mm -hmm. um, it's at my website distribution. What's one word? Distribution. La. So okay. not dot com, but dot la. So everyone should read those two articles. Just send me those. Send me those links, and I'll put them in the show notes. Good. Um, and I talk about how my preference, generally speaking, and I advise this generally speaking, is not to make worldwide rights deals. Um, now, over the past few years, that's what every company in the game wants now, and they want it because they're trying to protect the bottom line. <laughs> Where, because the revenues have gone down in different ways, in different territories, mm -hmm. and even domestically, they're trying to get a piece of everything they can. But you're right. Um, all these international sales companies, they, they don't know, they don't do domestic distribution. All they're going to do is take, is farm it out to the handful of people. I mean, they'll, they'll solicit the handful of people they know. 
And if one of them takes it, great. If none of them take it, they might just stop trying or they'll just hand it off to an aggregator in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they'll handle international. But they get a piece of that. Bullshit. Why? Um, now, I'm not um, a I'm not like that's my rule. I never break it. Of course. There, there are some companies out there who have a track record, as you point out where they may take world, want worldwide rights, but you know what? They actually do their best to really generate as much income as they can everywhere. And there could also be a good MG for that as well. That's minimum guarantee for people who don't understand that. So if you get a good minimum guarantee or a, yeah. a, a nice upfront payment, that says a lot in today's world. If you're actually getting an MG at all to, in today's world, that yeah. actually says volumes about what the distribution company thinks that they can make with the, with the movie, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. But also uh, bear in mind that 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 sometimes when these companies say, let's say, so I have a client who recently got um, 50,000 on his horror movie from a distributor up front. Mm -hmm. That's uh, probably all the money he'll ever see. He'll never see him. And you have to think of it that way, too, in a lot you of have ways. To think of it that way. Uh, it depends on the company, depends on do, do you do your due diligence. But there are a number of companies out there that if they if it's the right film. They may pay you 10, 20, 50 as, as a, an advance. But you'll but never see a dime. That's it. That's, that's all you're going to get. And if you're okay with that, and some people are, fine. If you're not okay with that, don't make that deal. Um, there's another company. Uh, I don't want to get sued, so I won't use their name. But they have an output deal with Sony Pictures. The owner of that company is a crook. Um, right. he, another company uh, that existed you know, back in the double O's. Um, with an output deal with Warner Brothers. Um, they made millions and millions of dollars, filed bankruptcy. Those millions and millions of dollars were never found. It was never determined where that money was spent. Um, screwed at a lot of filmmakers. Um, those filmmakers had their films caught up in bankruptcy court for I don't know how long. And he now has a company with an output deal with Sony Pictures. Obviously. And and I had a client who came to me. I've had a few people come to me uh, asking me, what do they think about the deal? And this one client, it was a $50,000 deal. And he said, I'm going to get $50,000 as advance. I said, look, this is the guy. He's a crook. You can look him up online. You can read about him. And if you're okay only getting that 50, you can make the deal. I'm fine with that. But if that's not okay with you, I promise you, that's all you're ever going to see. I promise you. And by the way, you're not going to get a fifty thousand dollar check. You'll be, he'll break it up over like a, a payments over the course of the next two years as well. That's something that they don't tell you a lot of they, times. Yeah, and that and that and I don't accept that either because mm -hmm. what if they go bankruptcy in a year and you only got half of what you were supposed to get? Correct. Get it up front, uh, or get it within the first few months. Get it before your film is released because if your film is they, once they release your film, if it tanks, they're not going to pay you. So get it before that in mm -hmm. the deal. Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, uh, I don't know where else we were going <laughs> with the, with the, with the crook. We were talking about the crook, the crook. uh, and, and cutting up and cutting up rights and cutting up different rights. Yeah. Um, I was a long night last night. Sorry, folks. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get a full night of sleep. So, you know, I go off well, on so, tangents. So, so let me, let me stop. I'm, Cause we're going to get to the aggregator in a second. Cause there's a, yeah. there's an 800 pound gorilla in the, in the room. There's an elephant in the room. If you want that 800 pound, there's an elephant in the room that we, we need, we need to discuss. But, uh, I got a, I got a client the other day, um, who sent me this deal from a sales agent and I was absolutely blown away at the audacity of this deal. It was just, so creepy. Uh, <laughs> the wow. deal was this. Can I see that deal? I. It was so the the bullet points on it were just so like really. Right. So the film was you know it's a low budget film genre kind of genre esque but not like a super action or anything like that. So very well put together, nice film, no stars. You know some maybe international faces but no stars. And the sales agent was going to take twenty. 20 to 25 percent okay he was gonna own it for five years yeah okay own yeah. it he would basically own the film for five years so he so he basically becomes the middleman so they can't they can't do anything with the film for these five years this man now becomes the owner of the film for five years and takes not only not licensor but owner 
license her for five years. Okay. Know, okay. For all intensive purposes, they are locked out of their movie for five years. Okay. Based right. on this. So they, he licenses the film from them. He gets 20% of whatever money he can bring in. The, the, this, the creepy stuff was he owns the IP for those five years. So any deals he makes with the IP, he, he keeps. Which I found for it, like it's not a superhero movie, guys. This is like a drama. Like I don't know, that's weird. He gets his name put on as an executive producer, which a lot of sales agents do, which I don't agree with. I same here. I hear and that. I think it's ridiculous. It's and just, the, it's, a, they're, it's they're an ego. It's an ego. It's, it, their, they're trying to puff up their IMDb. You know, I'll get to IMDb in a second. I'll get to IMDb in a second. There's a specific reason. I'll get to IMDb in one second. Then on top of that, he needs to have his logo at the beginning and end. Of the movie now, I get it with a distributor. I don't get it with a sales agent because right. now you're you're portraying yourself as you were part of this movie in a much larger way than you were. So the the filmmaker turned to me and said, "Hey, I looked at their IMDb page, and there's he has a lot of credits as an executive producer." I'm like, "Of course," because he has scammed a lot of filmmakers into this kind of deal. Which now, anytime a new filmmaker goes to check him out, they're like, "Wow, he's executive produced right. 50 movies." And I told him, "Like, do you want an IMDb credit? I can give you an IMDb credit. Do you want? I'll go put one on right now for you. How many would you like? I've got two fake. Uh, well, not fake, but um." Uh, uh, what's the word? I always forget it. Uh, um, alternative names that I use for credits that I just, cause I, when I do a movie, a lot of times I do so many deal, so many jobs. I just, can't, it's ridiculous to see my name a thousand times. So I right. made up a couple aliases. Thank you. I have a couple aliases that I use for like editing, post-production, you know, color grading and, right. and I, and how ridiculous the names are, are Mongo Wilder is one of them and Jalapeno Humperdinck. And I put them, they both have IMDb credits Pages with full credits, full, like a lot of credits on them, but they're real because they were me. But right. I'm like, that means absolutely nothing. I know people who who just throw their names on a movie because they showed up. So you can't be fooled by that. And IMDb doesn't promote that. So uh, doesn't police that. So anyway, that was the deal. Oh, and I think the expense, he had an expense account as well. Don't forget, he had an expense account for uh, things as well, I think. I forgot what the total was, but there was an expense account. And he got... Three thousand bucks, if I'm not mistaken, three to four thousand bucks, something like that, to edit uh, a trailer and mm-hmm. make a and make a poster, which he had final say on. Okay. He had no 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 say on this. Okay. And I said, "Are you insane? Are you insane? They don't do this." Oh, but this guy told me. I'm like, "No, run away. You're just giving money away for no and control over your film." And these guys were not rich guys. They're you know they they busted their ass to get their movie made. And I'm like, don't do it. It's just, but this kind of, these kind of deals are happening all the time. And if it wasn't for it, guys like you or me going out there trying to educate, right, right. people yeah. will get taken advantage of. You know, and, and the sad thing about that, Alex, is that I don't know if this stat is accurate. Today, it, it was probably accurate some time ago. Um, I, I use it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that probably 80% of the people who make an independent movie, their first one, never do it again. Mm-hmm. Either they realize it's not for them or they got screwed over so badly they never recovered and yep. they're never going to do it again. Mm-hmm. So if they had you mm-hmm. or me mm-hmm. or one or two other people out there who are on their side to really try to help them, you know, I, you know, if they don't have that, they're probably going to get screwed. These deals that you're talking about and that I'm talking about are, yeah, they're very common. Um, if, if you don't sign, yes, there's another 10 filmmakers behind you that they can, they can and do they're that. De- and they're desperate because they have no other options because they don't know any other option of making money with their movie. Right. You know, and I mean, that's ultimately why I put together why I started teaching this, because it's it's to me, it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Everything I understand and know about this side of the business to me is a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Um, But to most people, you know, filmmakers are creatives. They're not business people. Generally speaking, Mm -hmm. they want to make movies. They want to be creative. They want to excel. You know, creation, creative creativity is a self-expression art. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's well. That's probably not the right term, but I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. You want to express in the world, and your way of doing that is through film, uh, TV, film, media. And 
that's what you know. Mm -hmm. But if you don't learn this side of the business, even just enough to protect yourself, you may not be a second or third time filmmaker. You won't. Um, and that's sad because if you're in this world and you have this desire, I happen to have the belief, philosophically speaking, that if you have the desire, you have the desire for a reason. And that mm -hmm. reason is because you are to do that. You know, when people will say, I don't know what I want to do, with my, not filmmakers, but people like, I don't know what I want to do in my life. Right. Most people go through that. Mm -hmm. um, and. But if you're middle aged or you're in your 30s and you don't know what you want to do with your life, I think you just haven't made a decision. Your inner being, your heart, whatever, some part of your body has is interested in something. What is that? Oh, well, I can't make money at that. Well, how do you know? If that's what you're interested in, that's what you need to be doing. But that doesn't mean that's the only thing you need to be doing. So for filmmakers, you want to get better at your craft. You want to become great filmmakers, storytellers. But yeah, you got to learn the business or you're going to get screwed by the people, the sharks out there, or you're going to be with a business partner who's going to handle it all for you. Oh. And that person's going to screw you. Um, you've got to, you know, you got to write the checks yourself and you've got to pay attention to everything. It, and it, I, know it's tough. Boring. I mean, I know this business side is boring to most people. I don't talk about this in cocktail party conversations because people's eyes glaze over as soon as I talk, start talking about the business of distribution and what they need to do. Even filmmakers' eyes will glaze over. So mm -hmm. I don't get into it unless somebody, you know, says, Jerome, I really need to understand this. Um, the smart ones, the smart ones, you know, and I, not to be negative to anybody out there, but if you don't listen to, to this information or don't really take interest in it, you won't make it. You just First, won't make a sustainable career of this. It will be a one and done. And and it's sad because there's so much opportunity for filmmakers out there and so so much more so than ever before. But there's also a lot more competition and there's a whole other other thing well, in regards. Is. Yeah. But but I mean I mean I was I came up in the nineties, you know, during that whole Sundance, you know, independent film craze where every week almost I felt that there was a new yeah. lottery ticket, you know, a new yeah. a new Cinderella story was happening. If yeah. it was Rodriguez or Tarantino or Kevin Smith or Steven Soderbergh or John Singleton or and then the list goes on Richard Linklater, the, the list goes on and on and on. At that time period, it was a wonderful time. I have no and, doubt you and I crossed paths without knowing it at that time. <laughs> I'm sure, you know. I, it was, I was I was, was a good time. dance in 1994 when at the first screening of Clerks. You know? Wow. That was and I awesome. Was like, I was like, you know, here I am in the theater, you know, in, in Park City, black and white screening, sound a little fucked up, um, very rough. Uh, but at the end of that, I said, wow, this film has an audience. This film is a good film. And this film is going to make noise in one way or another. And it did. And, I, and it did. It did. It did. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was. And but those are the days that checks were flowing from a person who shall not be named, who was, um, yeah. who was, who was a catalyst for a lot of these careers back in the day, because he was the he was the the twelve hundred pound gorilla uh, at Sundance or or in the business at that time. But uh, you know, he, it, I, I heard he liked potted plants. Is that? Oh, true? Yeah, I think I think we're talking about the same guy. Yeah. So um, horrible. Sorry, it's, it's horrible. It's a little little weird joke. There. I know, I understand, but but it's. But it, you know that that was a weird time to be a filmmaker, and I feel that so many filmmakers still to this day live in that time. They make their movies with that model in place. Where and you know, I I agree, and I, and I think it's and it's it's um, I I have this theory that um, the reason that we always that filmmakers tend to be five or ten years behind or longer is because myths develop in our industry. And these myths are so powerful mm -hmm. and so strong mm -hmm. that we, we it's hard to break through with the truth. It's kind of like, it's not that they were ever fake news. They were real at one time, these you know Cinderella stories and whatnot. And what keeps them alive is every year at Sundance, you know, 20 to 40 deals are made that get all this press. Um, so the, keeps the dream alive, but, um, but when things change, people are still only talking about the way things were and they think that's still the way things are. 
Right. I mean, I, I, I crafted my directing career around what Spielberg would have done in the, in the seventies, mm. you know, like you can't like, look, like I, I wouldn't, why would I go on YouTube? Steven Spielberg didn't go on YouTube, you know, right. like, but the point was like, but he's, he would have, if he was born in this time period. Right. You know, if, if, if he was at that age in this time, Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, they would have all been making YouTube films. They would have yeah. all been, it's just a different time period and you've got to, right. Think differently now, before because we we're already we, we this is a, this is going on for a bit and I have no problem talking for another two three hours I, I know we could definitely do that but there is something that we did, did to discuss and um, this is how we actually met finally yeah was because yeah. of this situation and the the elephant in the room is distributor and what what the ramifications are of what has happened with distributor how it will affect not only independent filmmaking but distribution as a whole moving forward with these new the new gods that we before it was dvd it was vhs then dvd right you know cable vod for you know satellite and there were these different masters that we we kind of uh, you know we had to serve as filmmakers right now those masters are streaming services and platforms to we can get the movies out to the public. Right. And these platforms are dictating to us and to f- distributors as well that you must use these five companies who will aggregate all of the deal, all the all the technical stuff as well as all the money and with all the rec- with all the requirements technically that we're giving but they're given no not one ounce of requirements or, or any sort of rules on how to deal with money. And Distributor is a perfect example of the iceberg that we yeah. just skipped. And if we're not careful, there's still time to turn the ship, but we see the iceberg. But I have a feeling, you know, I don't want to be conspiracy or, you know, the, the world's coming to an end, but I do believe that this is a sign of we will be back here in five or 10 years with another company. Oh, sure. You know, there's no question. So I want to hear what you think about the whole distributor thing, how it's been handled, how filmmakers can protect themselves and so on. Um, yeah, well, I think it'll. Uh, my, my response to that probably will be a little uh, – to that question, particular question might be a little brief in that I think, first of all, I never used distributor myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I always steered clients away from them. Mm-hmm. Um it wasn't like I was some psychic and I knew there'd be a problem down the road. I just didn't like their business model. Um, I didn't like that, you know, you're going to pay them. Ex- well, you know, they went through a lot of different iterations of mm-hmm. their business model. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, you get, they get a percentage of your film, I think at one point in time. And then they got away from, you know, and then there'd be an annual fee as well. And then they, uh, you know, and then you just pay this amount of money and they'll sub- put it up on the platform. Or, the, or you pay them five thousand dollars, and they'll submit your movie to the cable and and the cable VOD uh, for your three thousand dollar for your three thousand dollar budgeted movie. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and you know, I I I just <clears throat> any company that is constantly changing their business model is a yellow flag, mm-hmm. and you got to pay attention to that. Um, now people don't follow this stuff like you and me, they don't track it. They don't know that distributors business models changed a few times. They're not aware of that. I I get it. But did they do due diligence? Did they call up previous producers? You know, there was, I remember at one point, and this might've been three or four years ago, whenever it was, when the person that we know was working there, um, the second time. The second mm-hmm. time he was working there. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, listen, um, I won't name him. I said, mm-hmm. hey, listen, um, I have clients that ask me about distributor all the time. You and I know each other. Can you give me, I know you guys promote, and you talk about this one movie and it did this great number. Yeah, uh, so the return of return of um, Jake the Snake. Yeah. Which was one okay. of them, yeah. And I said, are there any other examples you can give me that I can also share with my clients? And I kid you not, he refused. And his refusal was, I, we can't divulge that information. I said, wait a minute, I'm not asking for the actual numbers of those films, what they did financially, just I need more examples of films that have done really well. His response was, can't really give you that. I'm sorry, now this is a person I know, I'm sorry, that's bullshit, okay? 
You're just staking your entire company in your marketing on one film that did gangbusters and you expect everybody's going to come, you know, following you like lemmings. And they did. People did over a thousand films. Well, I don't trust that. Uh, you know, I, I didn't even do the due diligence of calling up producers who've been with them for a year or two. I didn't need to. But but the fact that this person wouldn't, you know, was evasive. That's always a bad sign. Um, so I didn't like that. Um, I always felt, look, they don't do marketing. They might say they do marketing. At one point, they said they did marketing. Hmm. BS. They Nobody does marketing these days for independent films unless there are certain parameters and situations, as you know. Um, I said, look, there are ways, there are other companies that you can go with that are not going to cost you money up front, mm -hmm. who are going to be direct with many of the platforms you need to be on. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to charge you expenses, and there are companies that will. So you select the right company, you do your due diligence, and be with someone that might give you an advantage versus just putting your movie out uh, through Distriber or Quiver or any of these other companies. Now, this is not a slam against, say, Quiver. I just used their name. But if you don't have a marketing budget, I mean, this gets in another topic, and I'll just say this, and I don't know if we'll have time mm -hmm. for it. But, mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to release the movie yourself, do it, take a DIY approach and use one of these platforms. Uh, you need to have a marketing budget. You need to have time to market. You've got to have things to market your movie. You can't just put it up on platforms today and expect that you built it and they will come. You know, mm -hmm. that they feel the dreams. Build it and they will come. Well, you know what? That was true to a certain extent decades ago. That's another myth that exists today. If you build it, they will come. No, not anymore. <laughs> That's too much. Yeah. It five or ten times and you've sold them to come. So... I, I think that with Distriber, um, I don't know because I never use them. I don't know what their TOS said, their terms of service. Uh, I have asked the question to people I know who've been with them. They don't remember ever signing an agreement. They don't even remember if they checked a box that said, I agree to the terms of service when they submitted their money. Um, if they didn't, and if there was no agreement signed, then, and I think, people following you are doing this, mm -hmm. then you get your, you, you know, you demand that their films, be your, their films if they want to be taken off the platforms because right. there is no agreement. There is no agreement. And if somebody says, well, there's an implicit agreement, I'm sorry. I got that from an attorney. Um, I think I, in your group, I don't agree. There's no implicit agreement. If you didn't sign something with distriber, but you gave them money and they put it up on the platform, they don't know. They don't have the rights anymore. They don't, you, uh, they don't have the rights, period. Even, they if they, the even if you have the signed agreement with them, they don't take rights. They're just an aggregator. Yeah, they're just exactly. a, they're, they're, it's, it's like basically saying I took my movie into this post-production house and because they edited the movie, they own it. It, yeah. it, it, it doesn't work. You're paying for a service, and that's yeah. all it is. The one of the one of the stories that I promoted very heavily on my show was Range Fifteen, uh, which was that uh, military zombie action movie comedy that went through them, and they made three million dollars using Distributor, and that was another case study that they used that, a lot. That was, I think, that was the one that they told me about that that that, that the person would only refer me to. Yeah, right. So, so you know, I, I had Nick on the show, and. And, and I've spoken to him and he's in my new book and all of that stuff because it's a good model. But there was a lot of things that his case made this – why it made it work, which is his audience, how he marketed. He's very savvy. He's a businessman. There was a niche audience that they've been cultivating for years. Like there was a lot of things. I mean they raised $1.2 million on crowdfunding on Indiegogo to make this movie. Like there's so many – anomalies that made that work. If those things are in place, could this be redone? Absolutely. And even a smaller or larger scale, depending on the audience and so on and so forth. But I spoke to him recently and he's like, yep, distributor owes me money too. So it's not like everybody, everybody's, he's like, yeah, I guess they're going out of business. They owe me money too. They've got a lot of their money out of it already. And they've already partnered with a, a foreign distributor to sell their movie outside of, of the U S and so on. But they've already made their money, but they're still owed money as well. So no one's immune to this. You know, I know there's Netflix producers right now who are owed money. 
you know, and that's a whole other mix and conversation to be had in regards to it. I, I, I agree with you 100. percent There, there, like even the recent the recent model, I think was you had to pay twenty dollars every quarter to get paid. You had to pay twenty dollars right. to get to get a check. Right. In what yeah. world? In what world does that make any sense? Like it right. was just, I don't know. I don't know. The I, sec- I, I, I have to assume that there is. Um, first of all, they were, were they were obviously to, for them to go belly up. They were spending money beyond their means, beyond what they were bringing in. Mm-hmm. That would be their share. Mm-hmm. Um, so there had to be a mismanagement of finances, um, and or coupled. Well, I would say probably cu- coupled with a business model that wasn't working, mm-hmm. but definitely a mismanagement in terms of what was coming in and what. And what they were outlaying for staff mm-hmm. overhead, et cetera. Um, and maybe there's some corruption there too. I don't know. Certainly mismanagement, maybe corruption. If there's and- mismanagement, you know, with millions of dollars, generally speaking, you're either completely um, an idiot uh, or you have, you're some incompetent or there's some other stuff going on. And we don't know. We can't, we can't say that yay or nay on either one, but I mean, I, I, the one thing I do find that was very funny, and I don't know, I don't even think I told you this, is because the movies that I submitted, I submitted those two films for a client, and uh, they were charging me on a monthly basis. They, I, ta- I called my bank up and said, if the, if this guy's tried to charge me, block it. And then I got a letter saying, oh, they tried charging me, they tried charging me my monthly, you know, thing that I had to pay them. And I was like, wait a minute, they're trying to charge me. After they've now released the information that they're in a reorganizational process and they have no money to pay anybody, but yet they're still charging me. To me, that is to me that's completely immoral. It's completely immoral because you're, they even told me we can't guarantee getting your we can't guarantee the service you're paying us for, but we're going to yeah. still keep charging you. Yeah, yeah, that's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Um, no, it's 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 ridiculous and it's really disappointing that. You know that this has happened to so many people oh. who are affected by it, and you know, so whatever thousand plus filmmakers who have to find new homes for their films that have already been exposed. So and maybe old now, old by other people's standards. Old so, movies, yeah, titles, right? You know, um, now Amazon, they can always you, you know you can always get it up on Amazon yourself through their service. Um, and that is a major, it's one of the big, what I call the big boys. It's one of the big boy platforms. So being there, you know, there's a lot of eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but there there are options as well. There's other options that I've spoken about, like, you know, indie rights or film hub or these kind of places that can do, they do good work. And again, anytime I say anything from now on, I go, please do your own due diligence. Yeah. Please do you do any kind of company that I ever recommend. Please do your homework and see if it's a good fit for your movie. It might not be. Yeah. But yeah. there are options out there. There are options other than going with another aggregator. Right. Which if those aggregators go down, we're going to be in the same place again. And it's and right. don't think it can never happen. Right. And, and I, I, I just said – I just released a podcast uh, uh, today and I said this very frankly. I'm like – all these problems that all the distributors are having, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this. All these problems that distributors are having trying to figure out revenue streams and how to make money and what's working and that the landscape keeps changing and this breakdown with distributor and all this. This is all happening in a good economic time. Right. We are arguably in a good economic time. Things are somewhat stable. There's growth. Real estate prices are up. The stock market is up. You know, overall, give or take, it's not for everybody, but overall, we're in a, we're not in 2008. Can you imagine what's going to happen when the next downturn happens, which any minute now, any minute, you know, within the next few years, we're, something's going to happen. We're late. We're due. It's cyclical. It happens. It's happened like that historically for the last hundred years. Something's going to happen. Right. How do you think this whole business is going to react? I mean, I think what happened in 2008, because you were, you know, I was, I was around in 2008, but I really didn't, wasn't focused on the distribution side of things then. What, what happened in 2008? I'm sure a lot of companies just went belly up during that sure. time. Sure. And, and, and I think it was, I, I was it 2009, 2008, somewhere around then. And I don't know that it was right at the time of the, the, the economic crash, but somewhere around there. Uh, this executive in Hollywood said, the sky is falling for independent film. 
the sky, the sky is falling. Do you remember that? Chicken, chicken little, chicken little syndrome. Yeah. yeah. And every media outlet picked it up, especially every entertainment media picked it up. There was conversations about it. Everybody was talking about it. The, the, progn- the prognostication of indie film is dying. That's what this guy was basically saying. Was it Mark Gill? I can't remember. I don't remember. Um, <clears throat> and I was, and at that time, I was like, don't listen to that. Indie film will never die. It will never die. It There's will, always it will a market. There will change. It will change. But, but they'll go through cycles of change. And, you know, <laughs> there'll be a bunch of companies. And we've, and I, when I was talking about at the beginning about the uh, foreign sales companies that, you know, two thirds of them are around today. Well, same with the, the domestic distributors. A lot of them aren't around today that were around 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. But new ones come into being, you know, whether it's uh, A24, you know, who has not been around forever. Neon, vertical. Gunpowder, you know, uh, gunpowder and sky. Or, I mean, there's always new people coming in. This is a country of innovation and entrepreneurship. So there'll be always be new distributors coming into being who need films. And, you know, uh, so it's never... It never dies, but it does shift and does change. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that's that's a conversation that I never really like to engage in too much with filmmakers because don't worry about it. Make what you want to make. Um, express how you want to express. Just understand the business. Try to track the business a little bit. You know, I know you don't want to, but read IndieWire once in a while. Read the rap once in a while. Read Deadline or Variety once in a while. Pay attention to kind of what's going on a little bit in the distribution. Arena. Listen to this podcast. <laughs> Listen to Alex's podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, yeah. it's it's um, it's an interesting time. I, I I really I'm trying to prepare filmmakers, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to shout from the top of the hill as much as I can that. You know, there. I truly do believe, and again, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's, there's a sound economic, you know, history here. We are going to go. Something's going to happen. I don't know sure. what. It could be smaller. It could be big. Something's going to happen, and I think it's truly going to affect our business dramatically with this this streaming war situation. Next year, there's going to be four or five brand new monster streaming services. Right. 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 You know how much? How many streaming services are we going to pay for? You know, and, like at a certain and, point. You know what? And, and a lot of them that have come into being are gone, by the yeah. way. Yeah, you know? Warner Brothers, what is it? That DC Universe one? That's gone. They, they you know, Warner Brothers tried to make that a thing. It, it, it didn't work because yeah. it was too niche for what yeah. they were trying to make happen. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting time. But when this thing does happen, or just the, even if the economic turn doesn't happen, just the economy of our industry, things are shifting so much. Yeah. That if filmmakers are not prepared, they're going to be they're going to be run over, and yeah. we've seen it, you know, so much. In, in just the history that you and I have been in the business, things have changed. I mean, can you, dude? I mean, remember two thousand five? Like that's yeah. that's fifteen years ago. It's yeah. a complete two thousand ten is a completely different world than it is today. Twenty fifteen is a completely different world than we had today. You know, it changes so rapidly. And, and, and that's also why the length of term that someone's going to enter into a contract is so important because, right. you know, keep those always, they're going, you know, anybody's always going to ask for a long period of time and your goal in your negotiation is to bring it down, get it down to two years or three years if possible, five max, because that company may not be around in five years. Um, or they were absolved, uh, um, they were absorbed by, here's the other thing that I, I kind of alluded to, but let's say you're with a distributor who is who who is bought by another company and so it gets absorbed into that other company this happens a lot and now your movie is in that company's library and that company doesn't give a damn about your film you're just one of a library uh your film is three years old they don't care it's in their library and that gives them a value they have a library that's an asset so um, you don't want that to be a long because you want it to be short as possible. So when that's done, you can now do your own thing, put it up on Amazon yourself, whatever, you know, um, because things will change and new opportunities will come around. And if your rights are tied up forever, you can't execute any of those new or newer opportunities. Would you, would you recommend that filmmakers try to include a performance clause? 
So like if 18 months or two years, something doesn't happen, they have an out or if they have money that was promised that they wouldn't make. Look, our estimates are that, you know, we've done our numbers. Have you taken my course? And I have not, sir. I have not yet, but I'm going to. I'm like, can you please? Uh, performance clause is one of the one of the key things that I talk about. In that's my, amazing. In my course. That's, fu- that's funny. That's funny. I honestly have not taken your course because I, <laughs> I haven't. I just, I just knew that from my experience. I'm like, yeah. performance clause. Hey, you know, you're saying you're going to be able to do this. Put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I really, I'm really big on them for um, international sales companies mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, they're going to give you, if you, if you ask for it, <laughs> you should, you should ask for a, a, a chart of minimum, maximum, uh, amounts that could be gotten for your film f- by each territory, and you should negotiate a performance clause, and that basically means that the film has to generate this amount in sales within this time frame, whatever you negotiate, mm-hmm. the yeah. number of sales and the time frame, and if it doesn't, you get your rights back. So um, that should be in that should really be in domestic agreements too, but it's a little that's a, I don't think we can kind of get into the weeds on that with. With aggregators, first of all, a lot of aggregators, the good ones, you can get out of the agreement if you, you know, submit within a certain time frame of writing, you know, 90 days. Oh, yeah. yeah, aggregators you could pull out any time. You just have to tell yeah. them. Yeah. So um, so that's a different, you know, area. Uh, but, but performance clause is really important um, as well as what I talked about before about um, uh, having the ability – to having a clause in the agreement that if they file bankruptcy or they go belly up, you can get out. Now, if they're absorbed, this is a bit, you know, I'm going to get in the weeds just real briefly on this. If it, you know, often it's, it's getting into an agreement, uh, that usually what happens in terms of a company being absorbed by another is there is an assumption that, you know, that, that, that company that absorbs the company you're with, they must honor the agreement that exists. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's pretty standard and it should be in the agreement, your agreement. But, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's, 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 I don't like that. If you try to get in the agreement that if they're absorbed by someone else, you have the option to get your rights back. You could aim for that. They might not agree to that. You know, that's a negotiation. So. Yeah, because their library is a selling point to whoever's buying them. If, and if, if they have 2,000 titles and 1,000 of them say we're out, then the value is just not there exactly. anymore. So it's – it's. I think we've covered a lot in this yeah. episode uh, without question. This has been an epic episode of about distribution, which I knew it would be, sir. I <laughs> knew that you and I getting together would have this – this kind of conversation. So, yeah. so for whoever is still listening, um, yeah. whoever is still listening, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Yep. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to get into the business today, or for you specifically, what kind of advice would you give a filmmaker trying to sell their movie in today's world? Um, so the, the the and and I kind of we touched on this earlier. Um, in terms of the, the number, the key things in terms of selling your movie today is remember this, selling your movie to either a distributor, you know, a good distributor wants to take it on and actually try to do something with it or to your audience. It comes down to is your poster, your key art, your poster, is it cool and interesting enough to get people to St- come off automatic. If I may, I'll just let me address this real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, we are creatures of, you know, we're in an environment today where many people have ADD. And even if you don't have ADD, and it's just not to minimize it, you know, your attention span may not be what it was 20 or 30 years ago, mm-hmm. or, you know, the way people were. So when somebody scans through Amazon offerings or Netflix offerings, or whatever, I'm talking about the general public, you have less than a second to capture their attention with your key art. If you don't, boom, they've gone past it. So less than a second, maybe maybe less than a half second. If he catches their eye, our brain will stop on that for a moment to look at it. Okay, you know, something caught our eye. Now we're looking at it. Now it's whether we like it or not. And if, and in, and this happens so, you know, nanoseconds. Is this okay? Let me look. Let me read the synopsis. Now they read the two sentences. Okay. Oh, hmm. This sounds interesting. Okay. Let me watch uh, the trailer. Can I watch it for free? 
okay, maybe I just start watching. Or if there's a trailer there, I'll watch the trailer, see if it grabs me. So that's the process. That's the thought process that your buyer goes through. If you don't get them with the movie poster and the title at the very beginning in that split, split, you know, fraction of a second, you've lost the potential sale. Mm -hmm. So it's all about what, I don't care if you made the next Oscar winning movie. If you don't position it right, and I know this is, you know, this is marketing and you don't like this stuff, but if you don't position it right, it has a huge impact on your sales. I had, can I just say, and then I'll, and we can wrap this up. I don't want to, um, <laughs> a client of mine had a trailer <clears throat> that I didn't love. I didn't think it was really effective, but they didn't want to spend the money. They had made it themselves. The editor and the uh, filmmaker made it themselves. Um, it was not horrible. It was not bad. It was just yeah. So what? Okay. Mm -hmm. And the movie was released with that trailer and it got on the cable VOD and we could, we were given the statistics um, of the people who watched the trailer versus the people who bought and the people who watched the trailer was massive. And the people who bought was, eh, you know, really mm -hmm. small. And I said, that's our evidence. We have a trailer that is not converting people. So, you know, finally they executed and made a new trailer and spent five grand on it. It's a much better trailer now, uh, but it's a little late in, in that part of the process. You need to have a really kick-ass trailer because that's your, that's the final sale. I mean, that's the final tool to, to convert. <laughs> so that's the advice I have for you guys. And perfect example to, uh, to illustrate what you were saying, uh, the Shawshank Redemption, the worst <clears throat> marketing campaign ever for a, a, the arguably one of the best films ever made. Yeah. The title was horrible. Yeah. The trailer didn't seem like it was, you know, like, oh, it's a period piece about some guys in a prison. <laughs> it's called Shawshank. What the hell's a Shawshank? And what, yeah. it, it, why does it have redemption? Like right. it was a horribly put together, you know, marketing situation, but arguably one of the greatest films ever made. So that's a, per and that, imagine if that would have done, been presented differently and would have had Absolutely. a different name. It would have done a lot more money uh, up front at the box office, though it's done okay uh, on VHS. It has, because, <laughs> because of who was involved in the film and the studio behind it, you know. And, it, the and also the time period it came out where it was VHS still, it was still cable was a thing, yeah. and people found the movie, yeah. and there wasn't as much competition. It would, you know, in today's world, I think it would still stand out. But there's just so much more competition for the eyeballs yep. now. It's it'd be yep. tougher for it to find an audience. So yes. we're in a tough we're in a tough time in history. But yet yeah. a very wonderful time in history. Absolutely, you know, you know. the the, the uh, democratization of mm -hmm. distribution has been a good thing and a not so good thing. It's it's I mean it's got its positives and its negatives. It was the same thing that happened to me in post when yeah. Final Cut Pro showed up and it didn't cost a million dollars for an editing system anymore. Right. That was great. But then all of a yeah. sudden, everybody's an editor. <laughs> everybody's doing it. And, and it becomes, as you said, a buyer's market. Yeah. Right. All right. So what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? The longest lesson in the film business or in life? Oh, my God. You should, I, I, you should ask me before so I could actually <laughs> think about it. Um, the biggest, what, what, maybe one of the biggest lessons for me uh, in the film business is have a, a great district, have a great entertainment attorney understands distribution. Mm -hmm. I talked about it before and really, and, and is qualified to look at distribution agreements and make them great for you. Um, and I, that, and that doesn't mean they're going to negotiate everything for you. I, I actually think the filmmaker should generally be the one to do the m major point negotiation and then they can do the red line and the minor stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, that's one of the most important lessons because that determines whether you're going to see money or not at the end of the day. Um, and I, you know, I, I've made so many mistakes in, in my, you know, career in this industry um, that's a, that's a mistake that, you know, that I had made at one time, uh, hiring producer rep two different times was another big mistake I made. Um, so learning not to do those things. I mean, okay. learning to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's yeah. good. That's good. That's good. Um, now what are three of your favorite films of all time? 
Oh my lord. Only three? Only, only three? three. Only three. The three that come to your mind today. I won't hold them. They won't be on your grave. You won't have them in in a uh, in an island, a desert island somewhere. Just three that come to your head today. The Godfather, mm-hmm. the first one. Very popular. Brilliant movie on many different levels. Apocalypse Now. Brilliant movie. I'm seeing a theme. Go ahead. Many Co- different levels. Co- a couple of theme. <laughs> Groundhog Day. Oh, fantastic movie. It's brilliant so good. Movie. And it's and you know why that movie's so brilliant? Well, in my view, it's so brilliant. Not only is it a a fun and interesting and constructive and hilarious movie, there is a deep message embedded. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That message resonated with people, resonates with people. Um, not everybody, obviously. I've had some, you know, people I know, oh, you know, some some women friends are like, eh, you know, I didn't really. Well, no, because, you know, because it's about the transformation of a man, which they're not identifying with, you know, mm-hmm. but it's a transformation. Movies that, yes, the theme of the first two, but I also really get into movies where there's a transformation that occurs. Another one I would throw out there is Local Hero from the yeah. 1980s. Yeah. The transformation of a person, a man, but a person from being materialistic and money to, oh, there's more to life than that, which is so universal, I think, for a lot of people. Well, uh, maybe in our country, not so much for everybody, but. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully more, hopefully more hopefully. people, hopefully more people. And then where can people find you and more about the work you're doing? Sure. Uh, so my website is, uh, again, one word, distribution.la. That's where I can be found. I can be contacted through there. Um my email, I can, so I can be contacted through there, and my email address is jerome at distribution.la. Um, there's a lot of stuff there. I mentioned before free articles and some interv- interviews there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I and you have, have a course. You have a course, don't you? I have a, 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 nine, a, a course that's on nine DVDs, which will be eventually uh, gravitated and, and moved online so mm-hmm. people can watch it digitally. Um, and it's a course I update periodically to, to stay current. Um, so if you want to know the A to Z of what you really should know as a producer, the course is a must. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get into the weeds only where necessary. I'm not going to teach you about the theory of distribution and, oh, all this weird, you know, behind no. the scenes stuff. No, it's what do you need to know to have success, to make money with your movie, not get and not get screwed. That's basically it. Um, so. Jerome, Jerome, it has been an epic conversation, uh, without question. I know we could keep talking. I mean, there's like about ten other questions I haven't asked you, but we just we just riff. So we'll it's a great. To, we'll have to do a part two at some we'll, point. We'll do a part. I think we already should do. This is already a part two. This should yeah. be a part one and part two. So long, but um, but it's a lot of great information, and I really thank you for being so honest and uh, and being uh, being a, a warrior out there for filmmakers as because you've been doing this for a while. So I really do. Uh, appreciate you going out there and truly, truly trying to help uh, filmmakers on their journey. So thank you for your for your service, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your service as well, doing the same thing. I mean, we're both doing the same thing. And, um, you know, and I and people benefit if they take good information to heart. So, you know, thanks again, my friend. Thank you, sir. I want to thank Jerome for not just coming on the show and dropping some insane knowledge bombs on the tribe today, but also all the good work he's done over the years trying to educate and help filmmakers get their film to the marketplace. So Jerome, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for keeping the fight alive and trying to help as many filmmakers as you can. If you want links to Jerome and anything we talked about in this episode, please head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 354. And guys, if you're a filmmaker or you want to be a filmmaker and you just want to make that feature film that's been dying to come out of you, please join me at the Make Your Movie Boot Camp that I'm going to be holding October 26th and 27th in Burbank, California. I'm just compressing 25 years of my experience into a two-day intensive on how to make a feature film and not only make it, but how to market it and sell it, actually make money with your feature film in today's environment. So if you want tickets, there are a few spaces left. Just head over to mymbootcamp.com. That's Make Your Movie or mymbootcamp.com. Now, I know a lot of you have been following this whole distributor debacle, and there is some new information coming out in the coming weeks. So please stay tuned. The best way to get all the latest information about what's going on 
is heading over to the Facebook group, Protect Yourself from Distributor. Just type in the word Distributor on Facebook and it'll pop right up. Subscribe and join the conversation to see how we can help our community deal with this insane, devastating situation that is hurting so, so many filmmakers. As you can tell, I'm really passionate about this and I really want to help as many filmmakers as I can. So whenever I have new information, it will come to you guys. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I really, really appreciate it. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. Make refreshing changes throughout your home this fall and save by starting with Lowe's. Add new appliances and get deals like up to 35% off select appliance special values, including a 24.7 cubic foot Whirlpool French door refrigerator, just $15.99. Show your home's true colors with a new coat of paint and save on top-rated one-coat paints from HGTV Home by Sherwin-Williams, starting at just $35.98 a gallon every day. Whatever projects you have on your to-do list, do it right for less. Start with Lowe's. Appliance offer valid through 1023, U.S. only. I've got to tell you about this cool show I discovered called Small Business Revolution Main Street. It's a business makeover show with tons of awesome advice. What I love about it is they do it all with heart. Not the hyped-up drama of those other shows we've all seen. Ty Pennington, the renovation guy, he's on it. And Amanda Brinkman, this marketing guru from Deluxe. Definitely check it out. You can watch it on Hulu, Prime, or smallbusinessrevolution.org.